So today I'd like to uh, discuss our lab's work, which is funded by the SENS Research Foundation, uh, on oxysterols, uh, the effects that they may have on age-related degenerative disease, uh, as well as our uh, strategies to remove these compounds uh, from human cells. Um, so for those of you that don't know what an oxysterol is, it's simply a uh, monooxygenated um, cholesterol derivative in the human body. Um, they're formed primarily by uh, two routes. Uh, one would be enzymatic modification. Uh, which uh, principally forms um, oxysterol species that are modified in the side chain except for 7-alpha hydroxycholesterol. These species are typically considered non-toxic in the cell and have a physiological role. Uh, on the other hand, uh, reactive oxygen species can also form oxysterols, and these uh, species are typically toxic to the cell, and, and they presumably have no known physiological role. So to get an understanding of what oxysterols are doing inside the cell, <clears throat> it's important to know uh, the role of cholesterol in the cell and within the cell membrane. So this is, a, this is an illustration of cholesterol and how it's oriented uh, in the membrane. This is a phospholipid monolayer, and these would be the phospholipids with the polar region up above. Uh, this oxygen moiety, which is the only one on cholesterol, this hydroxyl group, uh, wants to interface with the polar region, and uh, so then this is the polar region up here. And the hydrocarbon chain, which is hydrophobic, uh, resides down here on the inside of the membrane with the uh, hydrocarbon tails of the phospholipids. So the purpose of cholesterol in a membrane, it has several, is to primarily it decreases membrane permeability, has a condensing effect on the membrane. And it's also, importantly, uh, cholesterol is needed for what's called lipid-ordered domains, which are also known as lipid rafts. Um, lipid rafts are important for uh, protein, membrane protein function. Um, they serve as microdomains within the cell membrane, and they, uh, um, certain proteins will localize uh, to these lipid rafts, and it, it, it may affect their activity in doing so. Um, they also provide some organization to the membrane, such as they decrease interfacial hydration and they increase the uh, bilayer thickness. On the other hand, oxysterols, such as 7-ketocholesterol, which most of my research has been focused on, uh, because of the additional oxygen moiety that occurs right here on the 7-carbon, actually is oriented at a tilt in the membrane. And what this does is it kind of pushes the phospholipids further apart. It increases membrane permeability. And it also uh, inhibits the formation of those lipid rafts. Um, and 7-keto uh, keto is also known to partition to normally cholesterol-poor membranes and uh, kind of disrupts the normal uh, organizational structure of the membrane that cholesterol would provide. So 7-keto uh, cholesterol has many effects in the, in the cell. On the cellular level, uh, we see many things uh, such as apoptosis and necrosis are well known, well studied. Uh, it causes cellular differentiation. It can even cause DNA damage, reduce cholesterol efflux, inflammation, these types of things. In combination, all of these effects can lead uh, to further effects at the tissue level, which can result in the acceleration or exacerbation of age-related diseases. Um, atherosclerosis is the most well-known and well-studied of these in regard to oxysterols. However, everything listed here has been associated with high levels of 7-keto cholesterol, um, including age-related macular degeneration, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's. Now, 7-keto uh, cholesterol has probably been around as long as cholesterol has been. Um, you're going to find it anywhere you find cholesterol, typically at much lower concentrations. <laughs> so the body does have some defenses to deal with this molecule. Um, well, one of the enzymes which actually transforms 7-keto cholesterol is, act, is associated with heart disease. And the reason is, is this, this enzyme, 11-beta-hydroxysterodehydrogenase, reduces the keto group right here to a hydroxyl group. And this is the 7-beta isomer uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the hydroxy, 7-beta-hydroxycholesterol. And this is a, actually uh, sometimes more toxic species than 7-keto cholesterol which is why this enzyme is associated with heart disease. On the other hand, these enzymes here, such as CYP27A1, may completely detoxify 7-keto cholesterol by hydroxylation of the side chain or by um, uh, sulfation or esterification. The problem um, with these particular enzymes here and why they're not uh, completely protective against 7-keto cholesterol is because of their cellular location. Um, the way 7-keto cholesterol and most sterols will enter the cell is they're associated with LDL. They don't you know, float around, and uh, they're, they're all uh, 
um, hydrophobic. So they need to be present in a membrane or associated with an LDL particle or uh, associated with a protein. So they enter, in, they enter the cell as part of LDL. That means they're uptook uh, through endocytosis. They enter the endosome and the lysosome. And it's not until after that that they're passed on to the ER where they may undergo esterification or uh, shuttled to various compartments such as the mitochondria where they can be detoxified. So the problem that we're seeing with 7-keto cholesterol is that the toxicity is occurring at the lysosomal level. This is, an effect, this is uh, the effect that 7-keto cholesterol may have on cells. These are healthy human fibroblasts that haven't been exposed. These are fibroblasts exposed as 50 micromolar 7KC. It's complete cell death. And um, this is actually about half the physiological uh, level that we'll see in humans. Um, you may get up to, I think, a maximum of about 100 micromolar in an advanced atherosclerotic plaque. Um, this is toxicity. The dose response curves just showing um, the response of the cell, these fibroblasts to 7-keto cholesterol. Um, these other curves up here are oxidized derivatives of 7-KC um, that we were uh, testing to see what the function of certain transformations may have on 7-keto cholesterol toxicity. And what we found is basically that if you oxidize this molecule, you greatly reduce its toxicity. Now, uh, many of these studies that we previously did were done with 7-keto uh, cholesterol, and, and this is very common. Uh, people will take oxysterol, solubilize them in ethanol, and add them to culture. As soon as you add them to the media, they immediately precipitate out, and uh, they form crystals. And these crystals, we found, are more toxic than, say, how 7-keto cholesterol may be presented to a cell uh, in, in, in normal, uh, like in, in real life here. Um, normally, like I said, it would, be, uh, it would be present in the form of LDL. Um, so we actually started utilizing um, LDL, oxidized LDL, and um, specifically 7-KC loaded LDL, which had not been oxidized. Um, so 7-KC, so this was no different from normal LDL except for the addition of 7-KC. As you can see for all of these, even including normal LDL, high enough concentrations, they're all, they're all fairly, uh, they're somewhat toxic. Um, oxidized LDL is more toxic than 7-KC, um, but I'll show you in a little bit that uh, 7-KC actually has some different effects that oxidized LDL does not. So um, this, this here is uh, showing formation of foam cells. Um, we fed, uh, in this particular experiment, we used THP1 cells, which are monocytes. We differentiated them with uh, PMA, which is a very standard compound used to differentiate, uh, differentiate these cells. Um, they form monocytes and then we are macrophages, and then we load them with uh, various forms of LDL. Now, the problem we ran into was that after PMA differentiation, all the cells form foam cells. It didn't matter if we, formed, if we treated them with LDL or oxidized LDL or 7-KC LDL, they all became foam cells. And uh, you can just see here, this is staining with Nile, uh, Nile Red, which is a, uh, it's a lipid stain that um, changes color uh, based on whether the lipid is in neutral or polar. So because of that, we decided to alter our protocol and look for something that may be a little bit more relevant. Um, so we started, uh, we started, instead of PMA treating, we started just taking THP1 cells and actually incubating them just alone with the uh, different forms of LDL to see what that would do to the cells. And uh, what you see here is just these are uh, regular LDL-treated cells. After four days, we didn't see very much differentiation at all. This is uh, lightly oxidized LDL. Uh, LDL is orange because it has uh, antioxidants in it. Lightly oxidized LDL is still orange. It still has an antioxidant content to it. Um, and we didn't see any uh, real differentiation here. On the other hand, heavily oxidized LDL, which does lose its antioxidant content, um, we start to see uh, some differentiation of cells. And in the only 7KC uh, loaded LDL, we see very high levels of differentiation, way more than we see even on the, uh, on the heavily oxidized LDL. We see about a little bit over 20% of, uh, of these cells are differentiated. And importantly, macrophages can differentiate into different uh, uh, phenotypes. Um, these cells uh, are, look like uh, spindle cells. And uh, spindle cells are believed to be M1 macrophages, which are pro-inflammatory, versus M2 macrophages, which are actually uh, involved in wound repair. Um, we also looked at the effect uh, using Nile Red staining and, uh, and flow cytometry. We looked at the lipid distribution in these cells. And we see that 7KC loaded cells accumulate much higher levels of neutral lipid and polar lipid than heavily oxidized LDL, uh, lightly oxidized or regular ox uh, LDL treated cells. So knowing some of these effects on uh, how 7KC uh, LDL may accelerate foam cell formation by increasing differentiation, by uh, increasing lipid retention, we decided to think about um, what treatments we could use 
on, uh, on these cells to actually uh, help clear Southern KC and, and see if we could reverse those effects. Um, and then so there's, uh, we, we came up with two strategies. One was a small molecule strategy, and we were using a compound known as cyclodextrin to try to treat these cells. And we're also working on enzymatic approaches uh, simultaneously to see if we could find enzymes that specifically catalyze transformation of 7-KC. Um, there were some issues, um, you know, or some assumptions that we made. The first was that uh, the endogenous defenses um, were not sufficient to actually clear, clear this molecule. Um, some of the other problems we had to consider uh, one is that, um, you know, this accumulation, I believe, is happening in the lysosome. So if we wanted to use an enzymatic route, the thing we had to think about is the lysosomal environment. Um, the pH could be lower. Um, there's probably reduced availability of certain cofactors so that limits our enzyme choice. Um, there's endogenous proteases, so whatever enzyme we used had to be resistant to these proteases. Um, 7 kc is membrane associated, so we had to, you know, consider membrane, uh, membrane proteins or interfacial proteins that would actually interface with the membrane to pull 7 kc out of the membrane. And uh, also 7 kc is very similar in structure to cholesterol, so it's very, very difficult to find an enzyme that will work on 7 kc and not on cholesterol. And I, I think those statements are generally true of many of the age-related uh, uh, lysosomal residuals. Um, you know, not all of them are necessarily membrane-bound, but they're very similar to other components, and they're, they're very difficult to work with, which is why they accumulate. Um, so we, we started off with uh, looking at cyclodextrin based on some early results we got. And uh, this is to illustrate, if you remember the previous picture, this is the same concentration of 7-KC that previously killed all the fibroblasts. Uh, by treating with 0.9% uh, cyclodextrin, we basically completely eliminated the cell death induced by 7-keto cholesterol. Um, this is the, these are the cell viability uh, assays we did, and you can see actually even at 100, which is probably the most we would ever see, um, we still you know, significantly increased cell survival almost, uh, almost completely here with, uh, with, with cyclodextrin. Now, cyclodextrin is actually a drug that's in clinical trials currently. Um, it's being used to uh, treat uh, Neiman Pick disease, which is a uh, lysosomal storage disease where children, um, uh, they accumulate high levels of cholesterol in their lysosome. So we wanted to pursue this a little further, and we wanted to see the effect that cyclodextrin may have on lysosomal membrane permeabilization. So uh, we did, we performed uh, what is called an acridine orange retention assay. So we stain these cells with a dye that is uptaken by the lysosomes. And then after they've had a chance to accumulate this dye, we then give them various treatments. And then we measure this, um, this red-green ratio. Um, the, the acridine orange will actually fluoresce in the red region when it's in a lysosome, an acidic compartment. And it'll fluoresce uh, green when it's in the cytoplasm and nucleus. And <coughs> so what you can see here is uh, an LDL. This would be a normal cell right here. When we treat with cyclodextrin, we see this curve actually shifts to the right, and that would indicate uh, less membrane permeabilization than even like a normal cell. So this is stabilizing the lysosome in some manner. And with oxidized LDL, we didn't see much difference between normal LDL and membrane permeabilization, which is interesting itself. However, when we use just 7KC loaded LDL, we see membrane permeabilization as indicated by the shift to the left. But importantly, this membrane permeabilization was almost completely reversed by the addition of cyclodextrin. So this is very promising. However, uh, we, we performed some other experiments that gave kind of interesting results. One was that cyclodextrin slightly reduced the viability in uh, cells treated with normal LDL and significantly in, uh, in cells treated with oxidized LDL. However, with cells just treated with 7KC, cyclodextrin uh, reduces the decrease in uh, viability incurred by 7KC. So we still are uh, looking into this. We don't understand this. We saw some other interesting results. Uh, we were performing transfection experiments with cells, and we found that certain transfection reagents um, were actually, uh, say when we used all three of these, um, certain transfection reagents, which were uh, fine with cells treated with LDL or oxidized LDL, um, the combination of 7KC with these transfection reagents completely kills all the cells. So this is something we're still working on. Um, this is a shot of showing what cyclodextrin uh, actually does. Uh, just a, 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 it's a fluorescence image, confocal image. Um, the, color, the yellow is kind of co-localization between the green and red. Um, but as you see, you see a lot of green in here, uh, which would indicate, uh, you know, leakage. Uh, and what we're seeing is like the reversal of that here. Um, so that's where we are with the small molecule approach. But we also uh, were looking um, for enzymes that could attack 7KC. Um, now, knowing that the endogenous enzymes weren't enough, we started actually looking in bacteria. 
Um, so we did a lot of screening and we found quite a few bacteria that could degrade this compound. And um, this is the results of like a microarray experiment um, we did in one of these organisms. And we found two very large gene clusters that could degrade 7KC. However, the problem is that most of these sterol degradation pathways are very conserved and they all operate through the same pathway. Um, we did find that for 7KC, um, we found that this organism actually reduced and removed this keto group, which is ultimately what we would, that would be the holy grail of what we we're trying to do. Uh, because removing this keto group would then form, this, it would then turn this back into cholesterol. Um, however, this, this, although this reaction happens, it happens very far downstream. This is the hydroxyl group, and it actually disappears. Um, so this was, uh, we did um, knockout mutants, and uh, we analyzed the metabolites from these knockout mutants, and this is what was accumulating. So unfortunately, the enzymes, and I further test this with other metabolites, and uh, they were acting on a downstream metabolite, the, the enzymes that we were able to isolate. Um, so nevertheless, um, we were able to uh, continue to research organisms, and um, the typical route of transformation is uh, for, for these microorganisms is first oxidize um, the, the, three, uh, the three hydroxyl group on, uh, on seven keto cholesterol. So we were able to find uh, cholesterol oxidase that could do that job. This is data I presented previously. I'm not gonna go over this uh, that much, but what we found is that lysosomal expression of this particular oxidase, which is indicated here, was actually protective um, over all the other treatments we tried. We tried some of the endogenous enzymes like CYP27A1. Um, 11 beta was actually a little bit, uh, showed in toxicity uh, because it was converting probably to 7 beta. Uh, so this is all supportive of uh, what we thought we would see. Now, um, this, is, this is showing the, the one enzyme uh, that we engineered. Um, it's just showing at 50 micromolar 7KC, which was normally killing all the cells. Uh, we do see quite a few cells alive. Um, however, there was a problem with this. Um, this construct that we put, I wanted a fast and you know, quick way to get this into the lysosome. So I actually inserted this into a LAMP1. Uh, and I uh, deleted the interior of the LAMP1. I left the transmembrane domain, tagged it with the GFP, and left the signal sequence. Um, we got good localization. Um, however, the thing is, is we started seeing morphological changes in these cells after a short period of time. So for a short period, they were protective, but over the long run, they ended up being cytotoxic. And this is the reason. This enzyme, this oxidase, for every molecule that it transforms, it produces uh, one molecule of peroxide. Now, this enzyme is 10 times more active on cholesterol than it is on 7-keto cholesterol. There's plenty of cholesterol in the lysosome. It's producing a lot of peroxide. <coughs> um, however, uh, on this experiment, we had used some controls, and we also saw that, uh, one, there was a lysosomal membrane protein that offered significant um, resistance to 7-keto cholesterol. And so we performed some experiments to try to follow up on that. Uh, we overexpressed that protein right here, LAMP1. Uh, this is just uh, fluorescent images up here. These are bright field at, uh, at no amendment. At, actually, these are HEK293 cells. And uh, this is at 100 micromolar 7KC. They're actually a little bit more resistant than the fibroblasts. And I'll tell you why we were using fibroblasts and HEK cells. THP1 cells, are uh, they differentiate into macrophages. And it's very, very difficult to transfect a THP1 macrophage. Um, they're, you know, they, every time you try to transfect them, uh, probably the, the plasmids, the DNA is getting, um, they're very good at degrading things. So it, it's, 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 you get very, very low efficiency. Um, the route to that is using viruses. Uh, viruses take a very long time to construct. We're in the process of doing that now, but it just takes time. Um, so these are the results in HEK cells. And what we saw with LAMP1, uh, very high cell density here. And actually, even at 100 micromolar, which you know, killed most of the other cells that we saw, we still see a very high um, density of cells that are alive uh, with HEK. So something we knew was going on with LAMP1. Um, we also tried this, uh, this transcription factor called TFEB. TFEB is a master regulator of lysosomal biogenesis. It also upregulates exocytosis, um, and it's a, it upregulates everything involved in autophagy. So uh, because autophagy is also involved in lipid degradation, turnover, uh, we decided to test TFEB. Now, the, uh, the construct that I built has two, um, two phosphorylation sites that have been removed by mutagenesis. And this allows uh, this transcription factor to constitutively translocate into the nucleus, where it can then uh, uh, upregulate uh, these, these particular uh, genes. And um, actually, what we saw is a little bit of increased cell death in the untreated cells. But we did see you know, these cells, there's, there's, there's a number alive uh, through here. So um, it, was, it was better than, say, some of the other treatments we had, like ORP5 here. 
Or five is a uh, is a protein that is believed to shuttle oxysterols from uh, the lysosome to the ER. And uh, you see here, I don't know if you can see the staining very well, but you know you can kind of see these circular puff patterns. That's that's localized to the ER. Um, we didn't see any toxicity at low, but we did see uh, you know we didn't see much much benefit here. Um, we also tried, we also looked at a series of sterile transporters. So there was other methods we were looking at instead of just uh, trying to um, uh, transform 7-keto cholesterol in the cell. We we're looking at ways maybe perhaps we could accelerate its efflux out of the lysosome to different places where it could be reduced in toxicity. Um, the one, uh, this is star, this is star, star D3, star D5. Um, basically, we saw um, star D3, we saw a pretty decent effect using star D3. Uh, overexpression of this has been shown to be beneficial in uh, atherosclerosis. Now, um, so back to the DS1, this oxidase. Um, we actually feel that this is probably one of the best, best routes. Even though what we saw when we transformed this into uh, HEK293 cells was we saw actually increased cell death. This is, a, this is 48 hours after a transfection. And you can start to see a lot of cell death even in the untreated. In the 100 micromolar, there's basically no, size, no cells alive. Now, that seemed discouraging, but I think because what we know what's going on is the hydrogen peroxide production. Um, we've got a couple strategies that we're implementing to try to reduce this effect. Um, and also, one of the things that's happening, this was, uh, I don't even remember, this was, I had cloned this by inserting it into a LAMP1 skeleton, basically. Now, this protein isn't glycosylated, so I'm overexpressing this membrane protein that's not glycosylated. The inside of the lysosome contains a glycocalyx, which protects it from all the hydrolases in the interior. Possibly what we're also doing is, is opening up that membrane to attack by some of these hydrolases. So uh, we've got a new strategy, and we, we determined that we wanted to uh, you know, use this enzyme, but we want to maybe combine it with uh, catalase, which, could, you know, which would remove the hydrogen peroxide production. And then also, uh, we want to target it in a soluble form in the interior. It's an interfacial enzyme. It doesn't need to be bound to the membrane. And um, so we, we had to basically build a new uh, delivery device to deliver this uh, to the interior of the lysosome. By the way, this is, this is one day after transfection. You see the cells are still nice and healthy, and uh, they look normal here as well. Um, so this is where we stand with the enzymatic transformation. This is still a work in progress. However, uh, you know, we built, I built this uh, lysosomal delivery system. Um, and actually, um, I, used, uh, I tested it out by testing it with a detergent that could uh, activate a certain enzyme inside uh, the lysosomes that's in activated by 7KC. And also, I uh, incorporated uh, red fluorescent protein simultaneously. And uh, we do actually, it, it was interesting, we see a little improvement in cell death here. And I know it's hard to see in these pictures. Um, so uh, here's some of the uh, viability curves here. Um, this red is sort of a baseline for toxicity in the Jacques. untreated cells. A couple of minutes. OK. And what you see here, we saw a little bit higher toxicity in TFEB at the low levels. We expected this because we couldn't control regulation. All these were unregulated control. Um, the lysosomal delivery system, you know, we, uh, we were, were basically uh, built because we want to be able to control the expression uh, you know, and the, the, so the amount that's being expressed. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't do this because I didn't have a GFP tagged one, but this enzyme, we saw the most robust response. This is actually acid sphingomyelinase, which is inactivated by 7KC. Um, this is our lysosomal delivery system. I'll just go through this briefly. It's just showing, uh, basically, I get full expression. We have, a, we have an inducer, a repressor molecule. Um, it's repressed at the translational level, and I get actually over 30-fold uh, repression with this device, with this uh, delivery system. I can't exactly explain what it is, IP issues at this point, but it's modular. It's targeted to the endosome and lysosomal compartments. Uh, the proteins are delivered fully folded. There's no uh, extra additions, and we have good translational control. So to summarize, this is just an uh, overview of what we think our working model of 7KC toxicity. It's causing membrane instability, which may lead to necrosis or programmed cell death. It's also inhibiting acid sphingomyelinase. Acid sphingomyelinase normally uh, produces ceramide, Ceramide in the lysosome is actually uh, protective. It increases lysosomal stability. In the plasma membrane, it does the opposite. But in the lysosome, we're increasing it. So 7KC is the also decreasing membrane uh, or increasing membrane instability that route. Um, 7KC is disrupting lipid raft formation through this membrane instability. And, and by doing so, it's also reducing cholesterol efflux.
We know a couple ways to, uh, to reduce this membrane instability by upregulating this, adding uh, activators, or uh, potentially, but we think this is just a patch. Ultimately, we think that the most successful route is going to be the transformation, uh, direct enzymatic transformation of 7K2. Uh, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my uh, coworkers at Rice, my, uh, my old advisor, my now boss, Pedro Alvarez, Jason Gaspar, who's here in the audience, and uh, Laura Segatori, of course, the SENS Research Foundation, and uh, my collaborators at UBC. And um, <laughs> my advisor actually was, uh, his first day he was here, he took this picture in, uh, in Cambridge, and he showed it to me when we were sitting in the Eagle Pub, and he said, uh, I hope one day some people say this about your research. But uh, I think that actually extends to everybody here. I hope that one day a lot of people will say that about all of our research. So thank you. Thank you.